Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, CRISPR 101, Optimizing Your Gene Editing Experiments. My name is Beth Fry, and I'm a product manager here at Lucigen, and I wanted to welcome you all today. We're very excited you're here. All right, so on to today's webinar. Our speaker today is Michelle Aldrich. She is a senior scientist in our R&D department who is uh, leading our and developing our internal gene editing workflow and our CRISPR assays here at Lucigen. Michelle has many years of cross-disciplinary experience at the bench, um, including protein structure and function, protein purification and assay development, and many molecular advanced, uh, advanced molecular biology techniques. So we're really excited to have Michelle presenting today's webinar, CRISPR 101, Optimizing Your Gene Editing Experiments. It's all yours, Michelle. OK, great. Thank you, Beth. Um, OK, so for today's presentation, we'll start uh, with a technology overview. So um, this is uh, where I'll give you a brief background about CRISPR and how it works and how it works in the lab. Uh, then we'll go straight into some experimental decisions. So when you're first starting out, there's a lot of decisions that need to be made. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about um, an example workflow. Um, so this will be a workflow in mammalian cell culture. And we'll uh, kind of go through each of the steps uh, that you'll need to uh, be thinking about when starting out. And then lastly, we'll end um, with a, a list of the products that we have for gene editing. OK, so first, uh, technology overview. I like this review because um, this figure from this review because it nicely illustrates um, how the CRISPR process works in nature. So CRISPR is a form of uh, bacterial adaptive immunity. There are several types of CRISPR-Cas systems. Uh, Cas is CRISPR-associated, and that relates to the genes that are uh, within the CRISPR locus. Um, for example, CRISPR, uh, I mean Cas9, uh, is the nuclease uh, in uh, related to the type 2 system, um, where CPF1, also known as Cas12a, is the nuclease uh, within the type 5 system. So these are the two uh, nucleases that are most often used in the lab. Um, <clears throat> CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, and um, that is in direct relation to this array of sequences here. Um, so if you look at the different colored rectangles, uh, those are derived from DNA that came from an invading bacteria phage. So when a virus uh, infects a bacteria, it injects its DNA, and fragments of that DNA are inserted into the CRISPR array. And then interspaced between what's called those spacers is actually a repeat sequence, and that's shown um, with the uh, brown diamonds. This CRISPR array is then processed into CRISPR RNA, um, and that, along with the tracer RNA, makes up the guide um, that binds to Cas9. So this figure is actually a depiction of the type 2 system. So Cas9 is the nuclease. So when Cas9 binds its guide, it is now um, armed and ready to interfere with subsequent infections um, by uh, performing a site-specific cleavage of incoming foreign DNA. So since uh, 2012, when that mechanism was um, worked out, it was realized and, and showed that um, you can take CRISPR out of bacteria and use it in other organisms for gene editing. So since that point, uh, it has been used in uh, things like trait development. So this would be trait development in livestock uh, or crop improvement in uh, plants like uh, wheat and rice, um, as well as corn. Uh, for disease modeling, uh, so in cell culture and uh, in model organisms like mice, and in industrial biotechnology for the um, engineering of specialized microbes to make enzymes, for example, um, or in uh, pathway engineering to make um, unique biochemicals, and finally in drug discovery. OK, so how does an engineered CRISPR system work? Um, there are three necessary components in a CRISPR system. Uh, first, the nuclease. Uh, this would be the RNA-guided endonuclease, or R-gen. And examples of R-gens are uh, Cas9 and CPF1. You also need a guide. So this is uh, a short RNA sequence, or sequences, that forms a ribonucleoprotein, uh, or RNP complex, with the R-gen. 
um, and you'll need a target. So this would be the DNA sequence that's complementary to the portion of the guide RNA and contains what's called a protospacer adjacent motif or PAM site on the non-target strand. Um, and that'll become a little bit more clear in this next slide. So this is the Cas9 configuration and it um, it depicts uh, how exactly the guide RNA finds the target DNA. So the uh, target DNA is shown uh, with these gray boxes and this bubble here. Um, there are uh, two strands, or the target strand and the non-target strand. So the target strand is the strand that um, has a sequence that's complementary to the guide sequence. So this would be the CRISPR RNA. Uh, in Cas9, the guide sequence is uh, made up of the CRISPR RNA and the uh, tracer RNA, which is shown here. The tracer RNA uh, forms a scaffolding uh, for um, the right kind of binding to Cas9. So finally, as I mentioned before, um, there is the, another necessary component, the PAM site. So this is 3' prime to the guide sequence, and it's on the non-target strand. And for Cas9, that sequence, um, the, the Cas9 from pi uh, Streptococcus pyogenes is NGG. And these red arrows um, show exactly where that um, double-stranded break would occur if Cas9 were to bind its target. OK, so uh, Cas9 and CPF1 are just nucleases. They cut DNA, but they don't actually edit it. Um, the edits come in when the cell's own DNA repair mechanisms actually try to fix that cut. <clears throat> um, and there are two main uh, repair pathways in cells. One is the non-homologous N-joining, or NEJJ pathway. And the other is the homology-directed repair, or HDR pathway. So NEJJ is um, more efficient than HDR. Um, there are three outcomes um, after, let's say, Cas9 cuts the target and uh, a double-stranded break is, um, occurs. Uh, the three possible outcomes after that would be a perfect repair or re-ligation, so that would just be um, wild type. Um, but also uh, equally likely are these variable length insertions or deletions. So these are indels. And so that's where the edit comes in. Um, likely the indel will cause some kind of frame shift um, and likely result in the truncation of your gene product. Uh, HDR, on the other hand, is um, less efficient um, but more specific. And that's because um, it uses a repair template, which is shown here. Um, so the double-stranded break is here. And this re repair template, or donor DNA is another word for it, will have um, homology arms on either end of a piece of DNA um, that will be used to repair uh, the double-stranded break and therefore results in an insertion of new DNA. OK, so we'll next um, talk about some experimental decisions. So when you're starting out, um, there are a number of things you need to think about. Uh, first, what your desired outcome is. Um, and from there, the nuclease choice. Uh, there's a few different options that you need to think about for guide, um, and then uh, also how you're going to deliver the CRISPR components. So first we'll talk about desired outcome. Um, so I've divide, uh, divided the, uh, this section into different kinds of outcomes. So you may be interested in getting a loss of function, or a gain of function, or um, also a genome widescreen. So first, uh, loss of function. Um, so this would be when you're interested in knocking out your, um, your gene. Um, so in that case, you would likely go through NHEJ. Uh, but you could equally choose to go through HDR, where you would like to insert, let's say, a stop codon at a very specific spot. So that might be a better choice for you. Uh, CRISPR-I, or CRISPR interference, um, it's something we haven't talked about yet, but I will in a minute uh, in more detail. But basically, it's um, a form of transcriptional control. So here, you're actually repressing um, a gene of interest. And uh, base editing is where you're actually changing a single nucleotide. So that could be used to create a loss of function. For gain of function, you will probably go through HDR, where you would insert a, a new piece of DNA. 
Um, you could uh, also uh, use CRISPR-A, so this would be the opposite of CRISPR-I. This is CRISPR activation, so you um, are looking to activate uh, the transcription of a gene. Um, or you could potentially use uh, base editing depending on um, what kind of mutation you're trying to make. Now, genome screening is different from uh, this set of outcomes, and that's because over here you're, you really only have a, a single target or maybe a, a handful of targets. But genome-wide screen is the entire genome. Um, so in this case, it's a, a forward genetic screen where you're not really interested so much in starting with a target, but more starting with the phenotype and then working back to um, the genes that are related to that phenotype. So uh, you may uh, go through NHEJ for this, um, but there are also CRISPR-AI um, genome-wide screens. OK, so let's go into a little bit more detail about genome-wide screens. Uh, so like I said, it's a four genetic screen, um, and you're producing a guide library. And so this library could be um, your entire genome. And um, most often, there are several guides that would be designed for each gene. Um, they typically are th uh, delivered through lentiviral uh, vectors, so those guides, and the, and the um, CRISPR components are delivered on a lentiviral vector, so they are integrated into the genome. Um, the first use of uh, CRISPR um, in a genome-wide screen um, was done with the Gecko library. So this is um, out of the Zhang lab, and Gecko is genome scale CRISPR knockout. Um, and this is a figure from that uh, first paper that um, is a nice depiction of how that process works. So in this uh, first step, you're designing your guides. Um, you uh, want to think about uh, whether you're doing a genome-wide screen or maybe a, a large screen, but um, uh, possibly narrowed down to um, a particular um, pathway of genes. Um, then you'll want to, to make uh, that library of guides and um, insert them into a, a lentiviral vector system that then gets transduced into cells. And then those cells are either selected for in some way or screened um, to produce a smaller population of cells. And that population of cells is then analyzed for the remaining um, guide RNA pool. So here you're looking for an, an enrichment or depletion in certain guides, and then that can uh, relate back to the genes that are um, necessary or sensitive to a certain treatment. Um, so uh, this would be a knockout um, genome-wide screen. Uh, there are also genome-wide screens that are used um, with CRISPR AI, which I'll talk about in a second. But I just wanted to mention that um, AdGene is a, a publicly available resource for um, these guide libraries. So it would be a good place to start if you're thinking about a genome wide screen because it does list a number of libraries and, and how each of those libraries can be used. OK, so CRISPR AI. Um, this is a transcriptional control. So A is for activation, I is interference or repression. Um, you can uh, use CRISPR AI on single or multiple targets as well as a, a genome wide screen. And in this case, you're not interested in using uh, Cas9 or the nuclease um, as uh, something that cuts DNA, but actually is something that just targets the uh, DNA. So, um, the CRISPR AI system uses a non-functional or dead Cas9, where both residues in the um, active site uh, nucle nuclease domains have been mutated to alanines. Um, but it still binds its guide, so it's still able to target to a particular locus in the genome. So uh, that Cas9 could then be um, fused to an effector domain, and that effector domain could either be a repressor or an activator. Um, there are a, a number of different repressors and activators that are used. Um, I won't go through them all, but I'll just um, mention that uh, these last three activators um, were designed to really boost that activation signal. So they're uh, each a different way of bringing multiple um, activators to one locus. OK, and finally, the, the last uh, little desired outcome that we'll talk about is base editing. 
Um, so base editing is uh, a really cool um, use of the CRISPR system. Um, so in this case, you're actually changing just a single nucleotide. So um, in the first example, you can make a, a CG base pair into a TA, TA base pair. Um, there are multiple versions of base editors. Um, this figure shows the, the very first uh, version. So it works similar to CRISPR-AI in that um, you're using a dead Cas9 in this case, and it's fused to a deaminase. So the, the Cas9 with its guide can target a particular location, and it brings that deaminase into close proximity to um, a C, which it can then change to a U, and then through the DNA's repair, um, uh, the cell's own uh, DNA repair mechanism will change to a, a T. So you effectively get this CG to TA conversion. Um, so Cas9 from Pyogenes is uh, one of the uh, nucleases that's been used, although um, uh, other uh, versions have been used as well. And that really helps to increase the number of targets that are possible, because they each have their own PAM specificities. Another uh, neat base editor is the adenine uh, base editors, or ABES. So these have also gone through a great deal of evolution. And the uh, result was that now you can change an AT base pair to a GC base pair. OK, so we've gone through a number of different um, desired outcomes. Uh, next, you want to think about which nuclease uh, to use. So if you're looking to uh, make a loss of function or gain of function, um, the uh, common choices for nuclease are listed here. So we've got Cas9 from Pyogenes, um, but also I would, the Cas9 from Arias is, is being used. Um, we'll skip down here. We haven't talked about this uh, quite yet, but off targets are a possibility um, with uh, these nucleases. So that basically means that um, the Cas9 and Guide, for example, will bind to your target, but some mismatches are tolerated. And so um, binding to non-targets or off-targets is also uh, a possibility. So these versions um, that are listed here were made to, uh, to try to reduce that off-target binding. Um, CPF1 is a, um, another nuclease that people are using more and more. Um, and then I'll just come back up here and talk about the Cas9 nicases. So in this case, um, each of the actocyte residues um, uh, are mutated to an alanine, and that results in a nicase. So um, instead of a, a double-stranded break, only a single strand is cut. Um, and so if you wanted to use uh, these nicases in a gene editing experiment, you would have to use two guides, because you still do need to make that double-stranded break. But you'd use two guides um, targeted to opposite strands, um, and they would be separated by a, a certain amount. Um, and what this allows it for is higher specificity, because it does require um, both of those guides. So for genome-wide screening, um, Typically, knockouts are using uh, the Cas9 from Pyogenes. Um, and then the CRISPR-AI genome widescreen are um, kind of specialty Cas9 fusions um, that we, we already talked about. Now, because um, Cas9 and CPF1 are kind of the two um, most often used nucleases, I thought I would just spend a minute and um, compare um, how each of these works. So um, one of the major differences between Cas9 and CPF1 is the guide RNA. Uh, Cas9 um, has that CRISPR RNA shown in green, and then the tracer RNA shown in pink. Um, and they anneal together to form the guide RNA. Now this is different in CPF1. Um, CPF1 does not have a tracer RNA. It only has um, the CRISPR RNA. And that could potentially mean um, that uh, the guide RNA might be uh, easier to obtain for CPF1, so the synthesis is easier because it is so much shorter. Uh, so the um, location of the cut is also different. Um, Cas9 has a PAM site that is 3' to the guide RNA, 
uh, and the cut site is proximal to that PAM site, so it's very close to the PAM site. Uh, CPF1, on the other hand, has a PAM site that is 5' prime to the guide RNA, and the cut site is uh, distal or far away from um, that PAM site. Um, now, this could be interesting uh, for people because um, after an editing event occurs, it's likely that um, this sequence is um, destroyed and potentially the PAM site could even be destroyed with a, a Cas9 um, editing event. Um, uh, whereas CPF1, because the cut site is so far away, that, cut, that PAM site and um, portion of uh, the target sequence would be maintained after an edit. And so that means that recutting could occur. Um, and recutting may uh, increase the frequency of HDR because um, the target can be recut. So the type of uh, cut between the two is also different. So for Cas9, we've got a blunt double-stranded break. Um, in CPF1, it's a staggered cut, um, which leaves a 5' prime overhang. Uh, the staggered double-stranded break that CPF1 creates could assist in any TJ-mediated insertion of donor DNA. And then finally, um, off-targets. So off-targets are really guide-dependent. Um, CPF1 has been reported to have fewer off-targets. Um, which would be better. Okay, so we offer um, the Cas9 nuclease from Pyogenes. This is the wild type Cas9. Uh, it has a C-terminal NLS and a C-terminal 6X his tag. Um, we offer it at a high concentration, which uh, makes delivery um, very flexible depending on how you're wanting to uh, deliver Cas9. Uh, it's highly pure. Uh, we also offer it with the low endotoxin levels for those of you that endotoxin is something um, that you want to make sure is not in your experiment. Um, there's no detectable RNAs or contaminating endo or exonuclease activity, no detectable DNA contamination, and it's been functionally tested. Uh, we also have a control kit available. So the control kit does not include the enzyme, but it has materials to confirm enzyme function in vitro and positive controls for gene editing in vivo. So here are the components of the kit. Uh, it includes the CRISPR and tracer RNA. This is the guide RNA um, that would target a fragment of the human HPRT gene. Um, it includes a reaction buffer. So this um, buffer contains magnesium, uh, Cas9, uh, requires uh, magnesium for activity. Uh, and then the control kit also includes a uh, substrate. So this is a fragment of the HPRT um, gene cloned into a vector and then linearized. And this would be the target DNA for this um, guide RNA. And then finally, we have some control primers um, that if you were to use this guide in vivo, um, you could use those primers to amplify uh, the target region. So here we just have checks um, so that you can tell which of the components you'd actually need in vitro and which you would use in vivo. Uh, you could supply your own CRISPR RNA for in vitro guide screening, um, but if you did that, you would need to also have your own uh, target to be used in those. But if you did that, you would need to also have your own uh, target to be used in those assays. Um, the uh, HPRT CRISPR tracer RNA and the PCR primers are great for experimental verification. So I would highly recommend using something like this when you're just starting out because um, you want to be able to verify that your uh, workflow is working with um, some good positive controls. Okay, so now we'll move on to the next experimental decision. And um, this concerns the guide format, design, and source. Um, <clears throat> so Cas9 can, um, as we've talked about, the guide RNA consists of the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA. Um, but those can actually be um, fused into what's called a single guide RNA, um, so that you have a, a single RNA um, species that you would use in your experiments. Uh, and this is opposed to the system that's more like what's in nature, where you've got a dual R uh, uh, RNA system, where the CRISPR RNA is separate from the tracer RNA. And so this um, requires a very quick uh, annealing step. 
this is just really a preference on, on which way you'd like to go. Okay, so we're to our first poll question, so I'll turn it over to, to Beth. Okay, thank you, Michelle. So this is just a quick poll. We're just wondering uh, if you can tell us what kind of guide RNA you're using or planning to use. As Michelle said, there are a couple of different options here. There's single guide RNA and dual guide RNA. Um, perhaps you're using both single and dual for different experiments. Um, or maybe you don't know yet. Maybe you're still in the planning stage. Um, looks like there are some people that are still in the planning stage and don't exactly, haven't, haven't figured that part out yet. Um, but a lot of single guide RNA is there as well. Okay, we'll go ahead and stop the poll now. Hopefully everyone had a chance to vote. Thank you very much, and we will um, continue on with the webinar. Okay, great. All right, we'll just jump right back in and continue with our experimental decisions. So here we're talking about guide design. Um, so I've mentioned a few times about off targets. So um, what that means is uh, that mismatches are sometimes tolerated, and that can lead to off-target editing. So uh, here we're back looking at our Cas9 picture, and um, we are uh, looking at how the CRISPR RNA is um, complementary to the target strand of the target. Um, but really there's a, a particular region called the seed region, and that's what's closest to the PAM where mismatches are uh, less tolerated. But out here, um, mismatches can occur. And so what that means is that Cas9 and its guide can bind to unintended sites and cleave there. Um, and then that the cells, the DNA repair machinery would fix that site as well, but potentially um, an edit would uh, result. So what this means for you is that you have to be very careful when designing your guide. But luckily, there are lots of online resources. So I just have um, a number of resources uh, listed here. Um, most of these uh, kinds of sites will give an on-target and an off-target score. However, a few sites do like a combined score. Um, and basically, that's just telling you um, which is the, if you have a list of, of potential guides, which guide would be the best one to use based on on-target um, efficiency and the uh, lack of off-target sites. Um, I really like the ones that also give um, sequence information uh, related to those off-targets. So those are uh, pointed out with the asterisks. And I think that's important because let's say you've chosen a guide, but you do realize that there's a potential off-target <clears throat> site, um, uh, that's a, a possibility. Um, so you'll want to actually go, after you've done your experiment, check to see if that off-target was edited in vivo. Um, because even though it was predicted, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will um, happen in vivo. So you want to go back and check that, and you will need the sequence information to do that. So here are a few general guidelines um, for guide design. <clears throat> in the blue box, I have um, pictured how our um, control CRISPR RNA that comes in the Cas9 control kit uh, binds to its target. Um, so here is the HPRT target DNA. Um, the target strand is complementary to the uh, CRISPR RNA. Um, the PAM site is in the non-target strand. So first you'll want to ensure that the CRISPR RNA sequence is complementary to the target DNA sequence. Um, the NGG PAM, in this case we're talking about Cas9, so the NGG PAM site is located on the non-target strand and it is directly 3' prime to the CRISPR sequence, but it is not contained within the CRISPR RNA sequence. So that's a very important uh, point to remember. It is actually not within the guide. Uh, there are a couple of different sources for guides. Um, so uh, in vitro transcription is one, synthesis is another, um, and actually cloning your guide is, is another choice. Uh, in vitro transcription is um, very cheap, and you can um, make large quantities of it, um, but it does have some hands-on time required. Uh, synthesis is probably the least hands-on time, and it does provide high purity um, RNA, but it is the most expensive option. 
And then finally, you could clone your guide, which um, may uh, be the cheapest option available. Um, but this really limits you to the DNA delivery method, and it is also time consuming. So if you do decide to go the in vitro transcription route, um, we offer uh, the Amplescribe T7 Flash transcription kit, which would be very good for guide RNA synthesis. Um, because it is fast, you can get maximal RNA yields in 30 minutes. Um, get high yields, so for you can uh, produce over one nanomole short transcripts from only one microgram of template DNA in 30 minutes. Uh, it's flexible as long as you have that T7 promoter. Um, you could use any number of different kinds of um, templates. It's also scalable, so if you're interested in producing a lot of one guide, this may be the way to go. Uh, so this table over here is um, showing the yields produced um, uh, as, as it relates to the size of the RNA transcript. Um, and here's the size that um, you would be looking at if you were using this kit to make guide RNA. Um, so uh, making um, guide RNA with the Amplescribe kit would look something like this. Um, so in this case, we're making single guide RNA. So this would be for Cas9. Um, and um, we're using overlapping oligos to do that. So one oligo uh, will need to contain the T7 promoter. And this would be the unique sequence. So this is the CRISPR RNA sequence, uh, unique to uh, whatever your target is. Uh, and then the tracer sequence. Um, so this is the sequence that is universal. Uh, and then the other oligo would contain all of the tracer sequence and overlap with that first oligo so that when the oligos are annealed and filled in with um, an enzyme like T4 polymerase, you could produce a uh, double-stranded uh, DNA template for the Amplescribe uh, transcription kit and then um, make guide RNA. So we're here, we're uh, looking at four different guide RNAs run out on a uh, denaturing gel. So particularly for single guide RNA, because um, they're about uh, 100 nucleotides uh, long, um, in vitro transcription is much more uh, cost effective uh, than synthesis. Okay, so now we've got our, our second poll question. Okay, we'll go ahead and start this voting here. Um, we're just curious how you make or plan to make your guide RNA. As Michelle mentioned, there are a couple of different options. There's an in vitro transcription reaction. You could potentially order it from a commercial supplier um, like Synthigo or IDT or other suppliers um, or, or BioSearch. Um, or maybe you've got another method. If you do have another method other than those two listed there, we'd love to hear what it is. Um, if you wouldn't mind typing it in the chat box, that would be great. Um, looks like a lot of in vitro transcription reactions here. That, that appears to be winning among the audience here today. All right. Well, well hopefully everyone has had a chance to vote. Um, oh, it looks like Chen's using clone plasmid. Okay, great. Um, we'll go ahead and stop the poll and continue on. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Okay. So uh, the next thing you, you may need to think about is the repair template. And this would really only apply to those of you that are going through HDR. Uh, so the um, repair, re repair template or donor DNA is the piece of uh, DNA that you're looking to use um, so that uh, insertion of new DNA uh, results. Um, and the things to consider here are whether that uh, donor DNA should be single-stranded, double-stranded, um, and also um, how big the homology arms should be. So that is the, the portion of your donor excuse me, donor DNA um, that is homologous uh, to the target DNA. And so I would say that single-stranded DNA is um, what is um, most recently thought to be uh, the most efficient choice, um, although uh, this kind of depends on how big the insert uh, is. So that would be uh, the piece shown in red. So uh, for smaller size inserts, um, I think that single-stranded is definitely the way to go, but as you get um, bigger, you may actually have to go to double-stranded DNA and possibly even um, something that's cloned into a vector and then linearized. Uh, so likewise, for the size of this uh, homology arm, so that really depends on the size of your insert. For anything less than 100 bases, I think you could get away with 
um, something between uh, 30 and 80 uh, bases for homology arms. But as you get um, bigger in that insert size, you will then have to increase your, um, the size of your homology arms. Okay, so the next thing to think about um, is the delivery format and method of delivery. So there are three um, formats um, for delivering the uh, uh, CRISPR components. So you can either deliver them as DNA, mRNA, or protein. So here we're just going to go through a few of the advantages and disadvantages of each format. So DNA is the cheapest method. Uh, you could use standard DNA transfection or viral transduction uh, methods. It's good for hard to transfect um, cell lines, but you likely notice a lag in expression. Um, and the expression is not easily regulated. Uh, also, the DNA will probably randomly integrate into the genome. Um, and therefore, has, uh, this uh, format has higher off-target effects, which you really want to avoid. Uh, mRNA is cheap. You can generate uh, the RNA via IVT. Uh, you could use standard RNA transfection or micro um, injection methods for delivery. Um, it also does not integrate, so it's footprint free. So that's good. Um, there will be some lag in peak expression, and it is more expensive than DNA. And finally, protein. Uh, so protein allows for controlled delivery levels. So you can uh, choose to deliver um, different concentrations of an RNP to, to control the level that is delivered. Um, it is active immediately after delivery. Um, it uh, degrades uh, fast, so you reduce the off-target effects. It does not integrate, so it's also footprint free. Uh, there are many options for delivery. Um, and your workflow will uh, be very speedy because there is no cloning step. Um, however, um, there may be lower delivery efficiencies in hard to transfect um, cell, lines, cell lines, and um, it is the most expensive option. But I think more and more um, people are using the uh, protein or RNP uh, delivery um, format because of the decreased off-target effects. So your delivery uh, method really depends on the system that you're working in. So if you're working in cell culture, then you have a number of options, um, lipid-based transfection, um, electroporation, or uh, DNA delivery via viral transduction. Uh, in plants, uh, DNA delivery is typically done via agrobacterium transformation. Um, although you could also deliver components via particle bombardment. So if you are interested in reducing those off targets, this is a possibility in plants as well through RNP delivery. Um, with embryos, uh, a typical um, delivery method uh, is via microinjection. Okay, next we're going to go through a gene editing workflow example so you can exa uh, see exactly how this uh, might look when you go to do your first experiments. So in this example, um, we'll be uh, performing uh, a knockout via NHEJ, and this will be in a mammalian cell culture system. Uh, we'll be using the CRISPR-Craft Cas9 nuclease, uh, a single guide format made with the AmpliScribe kit. Um, this will be an RNP delivery via lipid-based transfection. And then finally, uh, we'll use uh, an EMC assay um, with T71 as the detection method. OK, so this is an overview of that workflow um, with the basic steps listed here. So first, you'll want to combine um, your nuclease, in this case Cas9, um, with the guide to make that RMP complex. Uh, the RMP complex is incubated with cells for a certain amount of time. So this is typically anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. Following that incubation period, period you will want to um, harvest and extract uh, genomic DNA. Um, and then you'll want to analyze the uh, transfected cell pool for the presence of those um, edited cells. So you may stop here because as you're first starting out, you just want to see if your experiment is working. Um, or you may continue. Uh, you could sort and select those edited cells. Um, likely, eventually, you'll want to isolate a clonal population. And in that case, 
um, you will have to, uh, following isolation, go back and, and reanalyze to see um, what uh, edits are present. Uh, so this workflow seems nice and straightforward, but there are a couple of steps that do require optimization. Um, those optimizations are um, iterative, meaning uh, you may actually um, be optimizing one step, but then needing to go back and re-optimize a, a different step. So you may actually want to go through to detection um, and optimize that, make sure you've got a good detection method, and then go back and um, optimize your delivery format um, and method. So um, they may, the optimizations may not go in the exact order of the workflow, but just for um, simplicity, that's the order that I'm going to go through. Um, so we'll, we'll go through each of those um, optimizations next. So first, optimizing RNP delivery with a lipid-based reagent. So there are a few critical optimizations. Uh, that um, you'll need to do. First, you have to choose a transfection reagent. We really like Miras's TransX2, um, but we've also had success with RNA Max from Thermo. So you want to optimize the transfection reagent volume, the RNP concentration, and the nuclease to guide ratio. Uh, so uh, depending on what you have chosen here, um, with the RNP concentration and the nuclease to guide ratio may change the reagent volume that you will be using. So we would recommend that you do some kind of matrix um, so that you will get the best possible outcome. So nuclease to guide ratio, I mean, you, you definitely want a one-to-one -one ratio at least. Some people prefer to um, boost the guide um, in their experiments just to ensure that every nuclease does have a guide. So uh, that's a, a possibility, but I, I do caution that this could change um, the transfection reagent volume that you need. Other potential optimizations would be cell number at time of transfection and incubation time following transfection, but these are, are not quite as critical. Okay, so we're to our next poll question. Okay, thank you, Michelle. And uh, this time we would like to know how you or how you plan to deliver your CRISPR components to cells. Um, is it through RNP complex? Are you doing mRNA delivery? Are you doing it through the plasmid or DNA delivery? Maybe you have another method uh, that, that we uh, haven't listed above. Or maybe you're doing uh, completely in vitro reactions and you don't need to deliver your CRISPR complex to cells at all. Maybe this is totally um, uh, all in vitro for you. So looks like RNP and DNA delivery are uh, the winners thus far in our audience today. Okay, uh, great. All right. Thank you. We'll go ahead and close the poll. And okay, we'll just jump right back into optimization. So in this um, workflow example, um, we're using the endonuclease mismatch cleavage at assay or EMC assay for detection, but there are a number of other um, mutation detection assays that can be used. Um, many of them uh, share the need for a PCR step, so it's very important that you optimize that PCR step. Um, so other detection methods requiring PCR are next-gen sequencing, gel electrophoresis, um, TIDE analysis, um, IDAA, and restriction fragment length polymorphism. Um, I can't go into detail with all of these. This would be a, a webinar in and of itself, but um, just know that each of these does require PCR. So it will be important to um, produce a nice, clean uh, PCR product of your uh, target site. Uh, one way that you could do that is using the fail-safe PCR system. Um, so this is a collection of PCR buffers uh, that we provide. Uh, I believe there's 12 A through L different buffer systems that you can uh, screen to see which one works the best for your particular amplicon. Okay, so the EMC assay, um, so this is using um, an enzyme like T7E1 from uh, NEB. Uh, it's a, a nice and easy assay, but it um, can produce sort of confusing results if you haven't done the optimization steps up front. So just a, a few guidelines here. You'll want um, the amplicon size to be anywhere between 700 base pairs and 1 kb. You definitely need that um, optimized PCR product because you want a single amplicon. The target site needs to be within the amplicon. and um, you'll need to uh, make sure that resolvable products will result. So these will be products that you'll be able to um, 
uh, see a size difference on a gel or in a fragment analyzer. So I'll just go that, through the steps um, kind of quickly. So here you'll perform a PCR um, uh, uh, around your target site, um, somewhere about 1 KB, um, where your target is, is somewhere in the middle. Um, and because this is performed on a population of cells, um, you could be amplifying uh, wild type sequence um, or mutant sequence. So when you mix those, um, when you have those amplicons and you uh, do a heteroduplexing, which means you'll just uh, heat up that sample and then do a slow cooling step, um, heteroduplexes will form. So you could get wild type um, going back to wild type, but you could also get wild type and mutant uh, heteroduplexing. Um, and the other uh, possibility is a mutant, mutant duplex. So T71 is a resolvase, which recognizes um, a mismatch or a bubble in the DNA, um, and it cuts, uh, does a, a cut right there where the um, bubble is. So the only uh, duplexes that are cleavable by T7E1 are the wild type and mutant uh, duplex. And so this can be used to determine um, if you have any edited cells within your population. So once um, you perform that um, digest, you'll resolve the fragments. Um, so here is an example of what a gel might look like uh, with three different editing events. So you've got your parent fragment, which would be um, those products that are not cleavable by T71. Um, and then you have your digest fragments. So that would be uh, the, the um, uh, duplex that is cleavable by T71. And so here's what we mean by resolvable products. So you don't want the cleavage to occur away at the end where you wouldn't actually be able to see uh, a difference between the parent fragment and the digest fragments. Uh, so then the relative intensities of those fragments are used to calculate percent gene modification. So the reason why it's uh, necessary to optimize this assay is because T7E1 does have some nonspecific activity. Uh, it's easy to over-digest your sample um, by incubating for too long or using too much T71 or too little DNA. Uh, the opposite, you could also under-digest um, where you're incubating for too short of a time or using too little T71 or too much DNA. <clears throat> so here is an example of a T71 assay where an over-digestion was done. So it's um, hard to tell the difference between the edited samples and the negative controls because of this laddering effect that's due to the non-specific activity of T71. Whereas if you took the time to really make sure you had the appropriate DNA to T71 ratio and incubation time, it's easy to tell the difference between your edited samples and your negative control. Uh, and here that is clear with this experiment where <clears throat> we had a known amount of wild type and mutant um, amplicon in a heteroduplex. So it was the one-to-one -one ratio. So um, the uh, theoretical possibility, uh, theoretical results should be that 50% uh, um, would result in uh, cleavage. Um, so here when you have too much DNA and not enough incubation time, you're only reaching about, uh, I don't know, 25%. Whereas if you have um, uh, too little DNA, you're actually over-digesting it and getting a result that's not even uh, theoretically possible. But if you've got the um, right amount, um, then you actually get uh, the right answer. So this is what, something you have to be careful about when you're uh, using this assay. Okay, so um, I did want to just take a minute to say that the fail-safe PCR system buffers are compatible with T71. So this is a similar experiment in which a known ratio of wild type to mutant was used, and then the, um, the fail-safe PCR buffers were used in a T7E1 assay um, and compared to uh, uh, the assay that would have a, the fusion buffer, the HF uh, buffer in it, and you can see there's really no difference in any of them. So that, um, those system buffers are compatible with T71. Okay, so to our next poll question. All right, last poll, everyone. How do you or do you plan to evaluate efficiency of your CRISPR gene editing? So maybe you're doing a T71 assay like Michelle was just uh, taking us through. Maybe you're doing next-gen sequencing. Um, you can select all that apply. So if you're doing more than one of these, um, please let us know what you're doing. Um, 
maybe you're doing an in vitro cleavage assay, or maybe you've done something that, or, or are planning on doing something we haven't listed here. Or maybe you're just not planning on checking efficiency at all. Uh, that could be too. So let us know what you're doing. It looks like a lot of people are doing T7E1, next gen, and Sanger sequencing. So great. Okay. Thank you so much, guys, for participating in our poll. Okay, so now we're it. back to that we'll workflow example. We've gone through the optimization and steps, uh, uh, and we're ready to just quickly run through a bunch of experiments. Um, so the, the next slide I'll show is really just starting here um, and analyzing that <clears throat> transfected cell pool um, for the presence of edits in, in a very high throughput way. So uh, a nice way to um, do that in a high throughput manner is to use quick extract um, because it pro it's very fast. It also provides PCR ready DNA. Um, so your workflow would then look something like this. So after you have um, uh, performed your transfection and uh, waited the uh, incubation period, you'll want to harvest and lyse your cells using the quick extra extract solution. Um, there's a, a quick heating uh, step required, and then you have DNA that's uh, ready to um, go into a PCR. Um, you may want to check your PCR uh, to determine that your uh, target amplicon is uh, a single and, and clean band. Um, but then you can uh, quickly go into uh, a T71 assay um, directly with those PCR products. Uh, so then you can start to uh, just build experiments. So especially when you're first beginning, um, you may want to uh, compare different guides or uh, do a nuclease titration or um, look at uh, various transfection reagents or uh, optimize that transfection reagent that you've chosen. So with this workflow, you can uh, quickly run through those is that transfection reagent that you've chosen. So with this workflow, you can uh, quickly run through those experiments. Okay, I'll just end with a list of the products that we've talked about throughout um, the presentation. Uh, so these are the products that uh, we offer. Um, we are the sole provider of the Epicenter products as well. Uh, so we have a CPF1 for custom order. Our CRISPR craft nuclease is now available as well as its control kit. Um, and the Amplescribe transcription kit for guide RNA synthesis is great. Um, we have a few flavors of the quick extract. Um, for genomic DNA production, uh, as well as uh, fail-safe uh, PCR systems um, if you're using a PCR-based muta mutation detection. And then finally, um, we do have um, competent cells for lentiviral guide library generation. So these are our Endura cells, um, and they can be used um, to make that guide RNA library for genome-wide screens. Okay, I'll end there and uh, thank everyone for listening and hand it back over to Beth. All right, thank you everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and take uh, audience questions now. Um, so kind of backing up through the webinar here, I think the first uh, question comes from Seth C. Um, he was wondering about base editing, Michelle. He was wondering, is base editing precise? Does, does it not um, So the, the first uh, iterations of the base editors um, had a larger window. So I would say if you had um, a couple of Cs in that target uh, site, then yes, they could uh, be edited. I think that uh, there have been more evolution of those base editors, and they've really tried to narrow um, that window. Um, but still, if you had, you know, two C's right next to each other, there is potential um, for editing both of those. That was a good question. Okay, um, and then the second question. Uh, you um, can detect them um, in a couple of different ways. So if you have an idea of what those off targets are, so let's say you used uh, one of those guide online design tools for guides, um, and that will give you the sequence information of potential off targets, you could then uh, amplify the off-target site and use some kind of detection method, whether it's a T71-based method or AmpliconSeq uh, or something like that. Um, that is one way to detect them. If you want to um, actually detect the off-targets yourself without um, any of the prediction tools, there are other methods out there. Um, SiteSeq is one. Um, uh, that's a good one. Uh, there's a there's a number of different detection methods in that case. Okay, 
great. Um, another question comes from Susan. She's wondering about whether or not CRISPR technology works in bacteria. Uh, she notes that the enzymes are, gener are prokaryotic in origin, but that there is some evidence that the technology might be hmm. more challenging. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yes, I, I do think that it can be used um, in uh, bacteria. I think that um, it's typically used in combination with the Lambda Red recombination system. Um, so I would probably encourage Susan to look at um, papers out of the Gill Lab. I think that would be a great resource for her. OK, great. Thank you. Hopefully uh, you're still listening and, and noted that, um, Susan. And then uh, Chen asks if we perform, uh, I think this is in reference to the mutation detection assay or the T71 assay, if we perform uh, our GPCR using raw or purified genomic DNA. And I think that probably means um, lysate. Uh, so we uh, use the genomic DNA that comes out of the quick extract um, solution. Uh, uh, workflow. So that is, um, it is, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it purified. So there's no like column step or anything like that. It really just lyses um, the cells and um, provides you the kind of genomic DNA that you could use in going into a PCR. Okay. Great. Um, it looks like we've got time for maybe one or two more questions here. I'm reading through. Um, Mahesh would like to know, um, does the size of the PCR product really matter for a T7E1 assay? He says he has tried with a 225 base pair PCR product, but did not get the cleaved product. They were supposed um, to I guess I would just say years. you want to make sure that um, what whatever size you're using is resolvable on your detection method. So like if you're using gel, uh, like an agarose gel, um, if you feel comfortable with looking at um, 200 versus 100 on an agarose gel, then uh, I think that would be good. Uh, if you're not seeing the um, products that you think you should be seeing, I'd probably um, go ahead and make some controls. So you can actually um, clone uh, that piece of your target into um, a vector and um, use that as a, as a control to make sure that you are able to see the sizes that you're, you're thinking. Um, yeah, and so you could uh, have a wild type fragment um, and a mutant fragment. So this would be something that you've engineered to be a mutant. Um, so you could start off with known wild type and, and mutant pieces to, to put into that. Okay, great. Um, I think, unfortunately, we were not able to get to all the audience questions, um, but due to time constraints, I think we have to call it there. Um, that's all the time we have today. So I want to thank our speaker, Michelle Aldrich, and thank all the members of the audience for joining us.